Last year marked the 50th anniversary of Unix. Today, I'm going to talk about the early days of Unix and explore many innovations that happened in Unix at a time much earlier than perhaps you might be aware. The typical history that these talks gave can be summarized in a three or four slides. In 1964, AT&T joined GE and MIT to create Multics. By 1969, this collaboration had failed. When AT&T quit Multics, this left Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie with nothing to do. Ken found an unused PDP-7, and that summer, the two of them wrote Unix for this ancient mini computer. This proved so successful that they convinced the patent office to buy them a PDP-1120. They rewrote Unix in PDP-11 assembler for the first edition, published in 1971. After that, Dennis Ritchie had perfected C. They rewrote the system again in C for the fourth edition in 1973. In 1975, the sixth edition Unix was released to universities where it became quite popular. The system was ported to new platforms and a number of user groups sprang up, including Usenix. With the portability lessons learned in the sixth edition, the seventh edition was released in 1979 and would become the basis for all future Unixes. It's here where Unix forked. Berkeley took 32V, the VAX version of the 7th edition, and added virtual memory and networking to it, created the Berkeley line of Unix, or the Berkeley software distribution. AT&T further refined version 7 and created System 5. This set off the Unix wars in the 1980s when AT&T was deregulated. Linux came along in the 1990s and wound up winning against a divided field, largely due to its open source nature. Here we see how Bell Labs Unix evolved into the main lines of Unix we have today. Apple's iOS and Mac OS are derived from Mach, which is in turn derived from BSD. FreeBSD and the other open source BSD distributions continue to evolve. While well, AT&T Unix is no longer relevant, Linux started out carrying on the System 5 tradition and has evolved significantly since then. Android, in turn, is based on Linux. So today, whether you own an Android or an Apple phone, you're running a system that underneath the covers is some variety of Unix. However, this diagram is more accurately representing what actually happened between the different Unixes with terms of code that they shared and the influences that they had on one another. The Unix ecosystem has been sharing and borrowing from each other for many, many years. And this diagram reflects the actual flow of code and ideas between all of these different groups. There's nothing wrong with the histories that are told like this. They paint the big picture of the history of Unix. They give a good flavor for the early days without getting bogged down on the details and focus on more recent developments. However, Unix history of enabling new and interesting technologies is so rich, much of it must be left out of these presentations in the interest of time. Today, I'll be looking at this history and also explain a little bit about how we know the things we know and what you can do maybe to help out. Before I get into the actual history, I'd like to give a shout out to two groups whose efforts have been indispensable in creating today's talk. The first group is called the Unix Historical Society, or TWOS because the Unix Historical Society is a mouthful. The second group is BitSavers. The Unix Historical Society, pronounced TWOS, has been collecting Unix artifacts for almost two decades. It started out life as something called PUPS, the PDP-11 Unix Preservation Society, and was founded by William Tunian. You can look them up on their website, twos.org. They have preserved many publicly available and also restricted use artifacts from all eras in the history of Unix. There's a browsable comparison page where you can view different versions of Unix to see how the source code has evolved over the years. The archive also provides a number of historical artifacts that make it practical to run old versions, either in emulation or on real hardware. Finally, the group has constructed several older artifacts that we don't have complete images of, from backup tapes, paper listings, and so forth, so that you can experience older versions of Unix that otherwise would be lost to history. I've listed a few of them here, but really most of them will be more relevant to talk about later, so I'll defer talking about them. Next up, I want to talk about BitSavers. 
This is a labor of love that's been run by Al Kassa. He's been collecting and preserving paper and media artifacts from important and obscure pieces of hardware for the last two decades. He's focused for many years on preserving those bits that are necessary to faithfully implement emulators so that they can run old versions of the operating systems that people want to run. He works out of the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, so donations to him of books or media are tax deductible. He also accepts scans done by others as long as they meet his standards. If you're interested, call him first. Without his work, none of the emulators would be possible. Speaking of emulators, if you'd like to run any of the artifacts preserved by twos or bit savers, you should use the SimH emulator. It emulates all historic deck hardware and many of the important deck machines. Some of the demonstrations I have later in this talk also use SimH. I'll include a link at the end of the talk with instructions for how to do this. One last thing before I delve into history. I need to explain who AT&T, Bell Labs, the Bell System, and Ma Bell are to the non-American audience. Simply put, they're the telephone company that enjoyed a monopoly in the United States through the 1980s. Bell Labs is the research division of AT&T, and the Bell System is simply all of AT&T, all the companies, all the groups that are together that comprise the telephone company. In 1956, AT&T entered into a consent decree that said it wouldn't use its monopoly power to expand its markets into other areas other than telephone service. This made the early licensing and distribution of some versions of Unix weird. In 1982, this monopoly was broken up. This allowed AT&T to enter the computer business and aggressively try to monetize Unix through the System 5 brand. Moving on. We learned in the standard history that Ken's first machine was a PDP-7. Well, what the heck is a PDP-7? I'm a graybeard, and up till a couple of years ago, I had no real clue. But during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the Digital Equipment Corporation, affectionately known as DEC, produced several series of mini computers. One of these series had 18 bits, which was half of the then current IBM mainframe size of 36 bits. And it started with the PDP-1 in 1959. It proceeded to the PDP-4 in 1962 and to the PDP-7 in 1964. Only about 100 PDP-7s were ever sold worldwide. The PDP-9 replaced the PDP-7 and sold maybe 400 units starting in 1966. And the last hurrah for this series was the PDP-15, released in 1970, also selling only a few hundred units. So by the time Ken got around to scrounging the machine in 1969, it was already almost two generations old, and by the time Ken and Dennis got Unix running on it, it was a full two generations old and considered obsolete by everybody. No wonder they wanted to migrate to the PDP-11. So what was the PDP-11? The PDP-11 was a 16-bit machine that came later in 1970. This was a wildly popular mini-computer that sold over 600,000 units across a dozen or more different models. It was superseded in 1977 by the 32-bit VAX, which introduced the concept of demand page hardware to this line. And the VAX became the standard computer to run in the 1980s and 90s in university departments. It sold over 400,000 units before being replaced by the Alpha. Getting back to our story about Unix. Remember to talk about the history of Unix? It's true that Ken scrounged the PDP-7 from the visual and acoustics department that was located on a nearby floor at Bell Labs. Ken was a bit of a gamer. He liked to play a game that was popular at the labs called Space Travel. There was only one problem though. We have only one screenshot for Space Travel, which you see on the bottom of the slide here. Don't ask me what it means, because nobody really knows what it means. Space Travel, though quite novel for the time and coded very efficiently, was still quite expensive to play. A game could easily run $50 or $100 in CPU time to play on the mainframe. Back in the 1960s, it was more common to charge for CPU time to recover the cost of the machine. Now, all this money was phony baloney Bell Labs money, but he was still concerned that he would draw undue attention for running up such a large bill for playing what amounted to just a game. So he found this unused PDP-7 and started porting space travel to this machine with Dennis Ritchie. The PDP-7 he found also had a fancy graphics console on it, something that wasn't 
available on the GE635 mainframe that he had ported the game from. There was also something very unique about this PDP-7. It had a hard drive. We'll talk more about that here in a second. Ken ported the game to PDP-7 Assembler. He'd cross-assemble it on the GE635 mainframe and take a paper tape from the 635 mainframe to the PDP-7 and load it up and play his game. But as you might imagine, this was rather tedious, so Ken wanted a better way to debug his game. Once he and Dennis ported the game, they needed to debug it. So Ken started to implement the so-called paper file system that he, Dennis Ritchie, and Rudd Canaway had created around the time of the demise of the Multics project. Soon, he had it working and a kernel to go along with it. In time, other user programs followed, including a shell, commands to manipulate files, and an assembler, all via paper tape, until the system was stable enough to be self-hosting by running the assembler natively. In addition to being a good platform for developing space travel, this proved to be a popular enough system to justify per getting the PDP-11 and porting Unix to it. As pivotal as the system was, though, its components have largely been lost to history. Up until a couple of years ago, we knew very little about the PDP-7 Unix. We knew from Dennis Ritchie's The Evolution of the Computer Time Sharing System that the system had a paper tape reader, a disk drive, a graphic display, and something they could print with. There was no deck tape drives on it, a detail that will be important later. We also knew that the system didn't have path names like modern Unix systems do. All the files were relative to the current directory. Also, exec didn't exist. There were some weird hacks to load programs one after another through chain loading. But otherwise, the system was quite similar to later PDP-11 Unix. The other thing we knew was that on December 8, 1984, Dennis Ritchie posted to the Unix Wizards mailing list a typed-in version of a program that he found in a notebook that had PDP-7 Unix written on it. The program was dsw.s, and this program would read the current directory and interactively prompt you for files to delete. So that's all we knew for nearly three decades. It wasn't until the last few years when artifacts started showing up that we started to learn more. In 2011, Robert Morris Sr. passed away. He was a security researcher at Bell Labs from 1960 to 1986. He's best known for writing the Crypt program and for coming up with Etsy password format. He saved a large collection of papers from his time at the labs. So many, in fact, that his family asked Doug McIlroy in 2015 to go through the... Doug found a implementation note for Unix that clearly was an early draft of the 1974 ACM paper. It appears to have been written in the spring of 1971 and describes both Unix 7 and Unix 11 representing the PDP-7 and PDP-11 Unix implementations, respectively. However, no source code was found at this time. Then, in 2016, Norm Wilson finds a small notebook in his garage. It was a copy of a book that was laying around the Unix room that he had made during his time at Bell Lab. He scanned it in and sent it off to Warren Toomey at Twos. The book turned out to be the first half of the PDP-11 implementation. After Warren announced this on the Twos mailing list, a group split off to reconstruct the system. People typed in the source from scans because OCRs of the old line printer printouts produced too many errors. They wrote a user land emulation of PDP-7 Unix, an assembler, and enhanced SIMH to include support for a PDP-7 configured like the one that Ken Thompson used to bring up Unix. Unfortunately, only about half of the programs were in this notebook. It had the kernel and user land programs alphabetically through ED. Two critical programs were missing to create a bootable system. Unix doesn't go anywhere without its init, and you can't type commands at a prompt without a shell. Also needed and useful are LS, LN, and MV. The volunteers on the PDP-7 restoration list rose to the challenge. The stores have been able to create an image with this version that boots that you can interact with. However, there still is no space travel due to an accident of alphabetization. This still remains the only screenshot we had of the game. Fortunately, the news gets unexpectedly better, though. Last year, as part of the Unix of 50 celebrations, the Computer History Museum in Mountain View released PDFs of the second Unix 7 book. It turns out that it was in the collection of Dennis Ritchie, whose papers had been donated to the CHM on his death. Once again, the PDP-7 Unix restoration group sprang into action. Within a few weeks, the missing sources had been transcribed and the images updated. There are several games that use the Graphics 2 display that was on the PDP-7, including Space Travel. There's an updated simulator 
and images available to run this. There's still no working space travel. This is how far space travel gets before crashing. But the problem is that the Graphics 2 was a custom computer that executed graphics programs. Today we'd call this a GPU. The trouble is that it's not completely documented anywhere. There's fragmentary information in the notes from the time, notes in the patents for the same card in a PDP-9, and of course, source for games like Space Travel, Tic-Tac-Toe, and Billiard. The Tic-Tac-Toe and Billiards games work, so that's some good progress. However, Space Travel used a number of tricks that wound up crashing the program or the emulator due to poor emulation. Alas, we will have to wait a while longer to play Space Travel again. While being able to run an ancient version of Unix is cool and all, what does it really get us? Well, by studying the system, we have found two interesting things we wouldn't have known otherwise. I'd like to share them with you. First, let's look at what we learned from the kernel and writing emulators to support it. We've learned that Ken's computer had a disk drive on it. From studying the code, we know it was an RC09 controller connected to our B08 disk drive made by Burroughs. We know that the system had 8K words of memory in it due to the organization of the kernel and the program. We also know it had a normal display in addition to the really cool display I talked about earlier. Further, we know that the Graphics 2 terminal was later turned into a little bit of a product by Bell Labs. They patented it and based it on a PDP-9. Ken's machine may have been a prototype for that. Finally, there was code to talk to a teletype of some sort. We know this both from the driver to send the characters across the serial line, as well as delays in the driver for carriage return and line feed that these old mechanical machines required. This sounds like a board list or an option list of the PDP-7. Let's see what we can do with that. One of the interesting things about DEC was that they kept extensive records about their customers and the machines that they sold. We are fortunate that one field service engineer, Bob Sutnick, printed out a database of all 18-bit machines that were under contract or had ever been under contract. Four were shipped to Bell Lab. From other records, we know that DEX CSS group created a custom disk interface for this machine. So, if we look at the four PDP-7 shipped to Bell Labs, we can eliminate all but one of them from being that machine. Serial number 34. Looking further at DEX price list, we can come up with a cost for this machine. So the machine that Ken scrounged probably cost Bell Labs a quarter of a million dollars to buy new in the 1960s. This is quite a bit more expensive than the later PDP-11 that they would pitch for porting Unix to, which was only about $60,000. But have we exhausted the number of Unix firsts from the data we have? Let's look more closely at the video I've been teasing you with throughout the rest of this talk. This is a film called The Incredible Machine. It was produced at Bell Labs in 1968. It explores all the cool things they were doing at the time with computer music, speech, and human perception. In it, we find a PDP-7. As you can see from my graphic, parts of the machine line up with the sales brochure that we have from DEC. Here's the console switches, the memory write status lights, and the paper tape reader. You also notice there's no DEC tape. Again, if we consult the field service list from Bob Supnick, we see this machine can only be one machine our friend serial number 34. So, I've been showing you the machine Ken would eventually scrounge to create Unix with this entire talk. And I've been saving the best for last. Well, maybe it's the best. <clears throat> In addition to knowing all about the initial Unix machine, the engineers at the Computer History Museum have taken it one step further. They have report stored a PDP-7 to working condition. They haven't been able to emulate our B08 C09 disk combination. Instead, they have used an FPGA to create a similar mass storage device, and they've hacked the 0th edition Unix to talk to it rather than the um, RB08, RB09 pair. The result is a 0th edition that actually runs in hardware. As you can see, this is Unix booting. Unix is a lot less chatty than it was today. It boots right to the login prompt without printing anything else. Later editions of Unix would only print a restricted rights message from Western Electric. It wasn't until we get to BSD Unix that we start seeing the device drivers announce themselves at boot and Unix started to get chatty. So this has been a very rich field. We have a number of firsts. We have the first system that Unix booted on, we have the serial number of this machine, and we have video or film of this machine running. And we have the first version of Unix booting on actual hardware today. So we've gone in the past five years from knowing almost nothing about the first machine to having this incredibly rich set of knowledge about it. Next first I'd like to explore happened with the first edition of Unix.
The first edition of Unix was the first complete rewrite of Unix. Since the PDP-7 and PDP-11 computers only share three letters in common, PDP, as far as their architectures are concerned, the first edition was a complete rewrite from the word-oriented PDP-7 assembler to the byte-oriented PDP-11 assembler. The target of this port was the PDP-1120, shown here. This was a simple little machine that could address 56 kilobytes with 8 kilobytes at the top of the address space reserved for I.O. The first edition of the manual survives, but the sources do not. The second edition followed six months later. It was the last for the 1120 and shows work in progress on the port to the 1145. By the time the second edition was printed, the number of installations had grown to 10. There are actually two other firsts that happened with the first and second edition. They were the first to have extensive commentary about system design. They're also the first to be constructed. And I need to give a little bit of a warning about what's online. The first edition of Unix was released in November of 1971, but the commentary is from the spring of 1972. It reflects the state of the system as it was a few months after the first edition and a few months before the second edition. Along with the commentary goes a complete source code listing of the kernel. Bell Labs didn't have formal releases in those days. They tended to do a rolling release. They would print the manual and also have the release just generally described when something interesting happened. So there's not an exact correspondence between the first edition manual and the sources that we have. So if you go online and look for sources for the first edition, you'll find really they're this mix of uh, early second edition and late second edition. The kernel comes from the early second edition and the uh, user land comes from the late second edition. We have the final dump tape from the PDP 1120 that has all the sources on it. And that happens sometime after the second edition. So for the combined reconstruction, we have a kernel, we have a C compiler, we have an assembler, uh, and we have uh, the beginnings of what would later become Live C. So when was the first fork of Unix? Here I mean, when was the first time that the Unix source code diverged and had multiple people, multiple groups, hacking on it and not necessarily sharing it back? Well, if you look at the standard history, you might think the answer is BSD as the first fork. Well, BSD was based on the 7th edition. Yet, if you look more closely, you might say, oh, it was PWB that forked the 6th edition prior to that. The Programmer Workbench, which focused on programmer productivity and interfacing with mainframes, was widely distributed outside of AT&T. But it forked a version um, that was between the 6th and the 7th edition, sometimes called the version 6.5. These patches were later leaked to 6th edition license holders. You might say that the Australians forked the first version because they took a 6th edition of Unix and created a BSD-like style of distribution where they would share it around. Even that wasn't the earliest. You might say, oh, Unix Software Group. It started with the 6th edition as well, maybe a little bit before because it was internal, um, and they distributed that to inside of Bell Labs with an emphasis on time sharing. Maybe that was it. No, 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 no that's not it. And then some smarty pants might go, hey, what about MERT? MERT was this real-time Unix operating system that dated way back. Well, you're getting closer. That was the fourth edition. We're still on the second edition. I'm talking about this, so you know that can't be the answer. Well, the first fork was something called Columbus Unix. It started out, li out life when New Jersey Bell forked the first or second edition to deploy the SCCS on PDP-1120. Now, the SCCS isn't that source code control thing that PWB would later distribute. No. Instead, it was the Switch Control Center software, and it was used for communicating between the billing part of the switch and the switching part of the switch, the part that actually switched the telephone calls. Support for SCCS Unix transitioned to the unit that was at Bell Labs in Columbus, Ohio, and became known as CB Unix. CB Unix would support all of the different Bell operating companies deploying Unix in a similar manner throughout the Bell system. It had a number of innovations very early on. In 1974, it had line disciplines. In 1975, it had shared memory. And these innovations were really necessary for the operating companies to deploy Unix to control and report switching data. If you can't control and report switching data, you can't make money if you're a phone company. So this was very important to AT&T. So they didn't force them to merge it back with research, so it existed for a long time. However, in the 1980s, when 
AT&T decided, hey, we want to merge all the internal lines of Unix so we could start to monetize it. All of these innovations were folded into Unix TS to create System 5. System 5, shared memory, and semaphores come from CB Unix. They are a little bit of an odd duck if you look at the different interfaces, but they work okay. The System 5 shared memory for the PDP-11 was called Mouse, and it wound up in the PDP-11 version of System 5, but in no other versions. Nothing really survives of CB Unix. You might find it mentioned in a few books that talk about shared memory in System 5. You might be able to find it in a few histories of Bell Labs if you look closely. And if you look in the 2's archives, you'll see that there's just a listing of the kernel on that's a PDF that was scanned. We don't have anything more than that. Now, in the PUPS mailing list years and years ago, there's email from Dennis Ritchie, which was kind of intriguing sounding. It was telling the person who had sent them the CB Unix tape that they'd received it and everything was well. However, it has not yet surfaced in his effects. Hopefully, this will be one of the effects that the Computer History Museum will preserve and make available. The, the third edition was released a few months later, and Bell Labs had been very busy. They rewrote the entire kernel to take advantage of the new PDP-1145 that they'd gotten. The success of the 1120 with the patent department had given them enough credibility to buy a bigger and better PDP-11. So they rewrote the entire kernel in PDP-11 assembler, but especially for the 1145. It required the 1145's MMU hardware to keep processes separate. This also marks the first time that Unix unsupported old hardware. In the introduction of the release notes, it explicitly states that the third edition is not for the 1120s anymore, but only for the 1145s. This is really the only notable thing about the third edition, but yet it's another first. Each of these editions seem to be having a first. Now we go to the fourth edition. With the fourth edition, the number of uh, sites has grown to 20, and it's the third rewrite of Unix. This time they rewrote the whole thing in C. Dennis Ritchie's C compiler had gotten good enough to generate good code, and now it was good enough that they could run the kernel with it and still be small enough to fit into a PDP-11. Now we don't actually have the fourth edition sources. We only have the C compiler from the time. But we have a backup tape from between the releases that has almost the complete newly rewritten kernel, except it's missing pipes. It has everything except pipe. But that's not the only first for this release. This is when different groups inside of Bell Labs start to use Unix. Now, when you think of virtualization, you might think of VMware. And when you think of VMware, what, that started in the 90s for Unix? And if you're really up on your Unix history, you might be aware of a couple other efforts before that. Um, going as far back, maybe, you might think, as IBM's uh, port of Unix, which ran under 360 VM. However, there's an even earlier version of Unix that run under a hypervisor, and that's MERT. I mentioned MERT earlier as this weird real-time Unix. Well, what MERT did is it took the Unix kernel and ported it to run as a process under MERT. MERT was a hypervisor that provided different processes and real-time access to processes that controlled hardware. And when you're a telephone company and are controlling hardware, sometimes you need this level of performance. So this allowed MERT to have a real file system and Unix semantics for most of its processes, but still have a couple of processes that would can do real-time things. And you would get real-time performance as long as you never touched the file system. All of this was in 1974. The other thing that happened with the fourth edition is Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson went to the ACM OS conference and presented a paper on Unix. In the proceedings, they just had an abstract of the paper. The following summer, they published the entire full paper, and this is the design and implementation of Unix, which is the first publication of a Unix paper outside of AT&T. This is the fourth edition family tree with the different flavors of Unix that I have described so far. Let's move on to the fifth edition. It followed the fourth edition release by about seven months in the summer of 1974. That's right. The phonetic programmers at Bell Labs did five editions in two and a half years. Everything I've talked about now and we'll talk about about the fifth edition happened in less time than many BSD projects go through a major release. The fifth edition was the first one to have an installer. Until then, disks were cloned to create a new system. Though calling it an installer might be generous by today's standards. You'd load a block from tape into memory and then jump to it, usually by toggling a few PDP-11 instructions into the front panel. In simulations, a few commands deposit the right octal values, which is a lot easier. You'd jump to this location, it would load the block and lock up the system. You'd stop the system and then jump 
to location zero where you just loaded the block. Then you get this weird prompt that I've shown on the screen asking for a disk offset and a tape offset. You'd copy the right boot block onto the disk, and then you'd copy the right root image onto the next part of the disk, all off of the different parts of the tape depending on what kind of hardware you have. Now you had enough of a system that you could reboot it in single user mode and build, rebuild the kernel and rather a lot of user land stuff that had hard-coded defaults based on what devices you had in your system. But I think you all agree, we've come a long way from this, and it even makes the FreeBSD 1.0 installer seem rather advanced. The other notable thing about the fifth edition was it was basically the first one to go out. Well, a couple of copies of the fourth edition may have shipped, given the dates of various license agreements that we know about with the early universities. The fifth edition is when Unix entered the universities. It's time to ask the question now. When was the first networking code in Unix? Given that everybody uses a BSD-derived stack from 4.2 BSD, we might think it was in BSD that we got networking. And in some sense, that's true. However, there's a much richer history here that I'd like to explore. The 4.2 BSD code added sockets to the system. Sam Leffler did that work. He based his work on something earlier, though. Sam started with the BBN TCP IP stack and basically rewrote it. The BBN stack has some nice features which were lost, though. Bash has brought a few of them back. For example, slash dev slash net slash host could be used to open a connection to a remote host. In those days, there was a single file for the entire network, and it could easily be cached. However, once the network grew and DNS became a thing, this became impractical. BBN's VAX TCP IP stack was based on an earlier version 6 TCP IP stack that was popular on the internet that they did for the PDP-11. It implemented TCP IP as a daemon, and everything below that was in the kernel. Yet, there was an even earlier TCP IP stack for the 6th edition written in Macro 11 done at the Stanford Research Institute, SRI for their PDP-11 based terminal interface unit. But we're talking about the fifth edition, so that can't be the earliest. There was an even earlier protocol on the internet used called NCP, Network Control Protocol, that predated TCP IP. Steve Holger at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign created the first networking Unix outside of Bell Labs based on the fifth edition of Unix. He had friends at Bell Labs and did much of his work as a device driver so he could track updates from the labs to the fifth edition. When the sixth edition came out, it was a quick port to that, and he was able to release it to the world. That took the ARPANET by storm in 1975. If you look at DARPA's surveys of resources available on the ARPANET, the 1974 survey shows no Unix systems at all. The 1975 survey shows a few, and by 1976, they're ubiquitous. But a careful listener might have caught the phrase outside of Bell Labs a moment ago. So while the first public networking release was Network Unix, based on version 5, we have to jump back about eight months to the fourth edition to find the first network of any kind. In the fourth edition, there's an obscure little driver hidden away in a subdirectory of DMR, which would later be changed to dev, killing a little bit of whimsy. But this driver was called TICU, and it was an interface to the Spider or Datalink network. Datalink was an effort by Alexander Fraser to create a network based on small packets and circuit switching. These ideas would one day grow and mature into ATM. So Bell Labs had a perfectly fine network a couple of years before the outside world and felt no real need to change it. Spider was circuit switched, much like telephone calls were. This differed from the packet switch network of ARPANET in that each end-to-end -end connection had a dedicated virtual circuit. This fundamental difference in networking technology is why AT&T Unix was so late with its own TCP IP implementation, lagging almost a decade behind the rest of the Unix ecosystem, and why there are many third-party TCP IP implementations for System 5 Unix. I could do an entire talk on the different multiprocessors implementations of Unix in the 1980s. That talk would start with Purdue's efforts in 1981 to string two VAX 780s together to run Unix on that. They wrote a fairly interesting paper describing their efforts and DEC's marketing of it as the 11782. However, if you look at the paper, you'll find that they credit an even earlier effort called MUnix with the first Unix multiprocessing implementation. At the Naval Postgraduate School at Monterey, John Howley and Walter Meyer worked with DECT to create a multiprocessor PDP-11 based on the PDP-1150. Two processors were loosely coupled across a shared bus. One of them primarily did display, while the other one primarily did disk I.O. Processors could run on either CPU to take advantage of 
idle CPU cycles on the other CPU. However, they would need to switch to the processor to which the hardware they wanted to talk to was attached. This turned out to be a typical ASMP implementation, asymmetrical multiprocessing. One of the processors wound up being the master, while the other one wound up being the slave. Unfortunately, their paper is the only thing that survives from this time frame. There are no photos of the actual machine, let alone surviving source code. The paper describes the problems of having a global U area, needing to make it a pointer so the different processors could have their own copy of it, and the need for mutual exclusion. MUnix chose semaphores to protect critical sections of their code. Holly and Meyer did their work in 1975 on a fifth edition of Unix, though they finished the code in the summer just after the sixth edition was released. None of the code from this effort made it into a version of Research Unix. In fact, it would take more than a decade until 1990 for AT&T to release a multi-processing version of System 5, and that was done by a consortium of Intel resellers who were Unix licensees rather than by AT&T itself. Before we move on to the 6th edition, there's one last I'm going to report for the 5th edition. It was the last edition of Unix to report the number of installations in its introduction. Another bit of whimsy that has been lost. The 6th edition of Unix had a lot of firsts. Many of them are currently recognized as such and aren't really lost to history. It was the first release to be widely distributed in universities. It was the system that the first Berkeley software distribution targeted. It had the first port to non-PDP-11 hardware. It was the first commercially licensed to the RAND Corporation. It had the first book published about it, The Lion's Commentary. Many of these stories are familiar to people, so instead I'm going to focus on one of the two more obscure facts, the first Unix distro and the first set of emulators. I've already alluded to the first Unix distribution when I was talking about forks. The Australian universities were hard put for cash for hardware in the 1970s. Richard Miller joined the University of Wollongong with the promise of a PDP-11 to run Unix on, but by the time he arrived, the budget had been cut and the university had to buy an Interdata 732 instead. This forced him to port Unix to this 32-bit processor and for him to make a couple of 80-kilometer, 50-mile drives to the University of New South Wales in Sydney to use their PDP-11 to get his port of the C compiler to the entered data bootstrap. The same budgetary pressures that led to the first port of Unix also led to the first long-term distribution. ASAM is a crazy name to remember. It's short for the Australian Unix Shared Accounting Model. It was a joint effort by the universities of Sydney and New South Wales. It started in the late 70s as an effort by these Australian universities to save money by making their current hardware more efficient so it could support more users. It also improved security of the system. This distribution was used not only in Australia, but in parts of Europe and America. It was based on version 6 Unix and started in about 1976, just after the universities received their copy. It ran through the mid 80s. These distributions included not only their modified Unix software, but also additional utilities like compilers, graphics packages, and bits from Usenix tapes. The additional utilities were more useful in using other DEX software or filled in the gaps of the base system. The kernel modifications were very extensive, adding many new features from something as trivial as flushing the super blocks more often to get better time in case the system crashed, to extensive circular buffer changes to make pipes more efficient. New drivers for different tape drives and better disk drives were included as well. The distribution also includes 40 or 50 fixes to Bell Labs Unix, mostly in the kernel. Some of these fixes were later included in version 7 of the operating system. Many of these patches were contributed by other universities. Some of the features that didn't make it into version 7 Unix wound up in the BSD2 distributions of code as well. There was never a move to version 7. Version 7 required a larger system than many of the Australian universities had. In addition, many of the same functions that was served by AWSAM were taken up by Berkeley with the BSD tapes instead. So, since this modified the base system, included other software, and included contributions from users, I've marked this as the first distro or distribution of Unix outside of Bell Labs. Emulation is another area that has existed much longer than many people realize. Many people are familiar with the commercial Unix distribution emulations that are included in 
4.4 BSD are done by Linux. And these are fairly ordinary and have been around since the 1990s. Some people may be aware of Unis, a 4.2 BSD kernel that ran under VMS that allowed Unix programs to run there. Some people are aware of it and wish they weren't. Some of the more senior folks may know that 4.2 BSD had code that could run version 6 and version 7 PDP-11 binaries in emulation. But emulation in Unix dates back to when the first Unix systems landed in universities. Many universities needed to run Fortran or BASIC, or had lots of code written in Macro 11. None of these were available on Unix, or the ones that were available weren't of high quality. This code worked on DEX other operating systems for the PDP-11, like RSX-11 or RT-11. But DEC didn't provide any support for these programs under Unix. The first emulators allowed programs that were compiled for RT-11 to run under Unix by emulating RT-11 system calls. This allowed the universities to still run Fortran or BASIC on their Unix systems. In fact, the Dungeon Game, which was quite popular years ago, was an early version of Zork 1, was a PDP-11 binary that ran under 4.2 BSD with emulation mode. What many people didn't realize even at the time was this was an RT11 binary that had been converted to run under Unix using software libraries to do the system call emulation. These emulators are largely forgotten today because the need for them has largely evaporated. If you need to run on a PDP-11, you run SimH. I'm going to end my talk with one final thing that was important about version 6, and that was its users and their users groups. Because AT&T could provide no support to them due to the consent decree signed in the 1950s, this forced users to band together to solve their own problems. If you go and look at the newsletters from these user groups, they're full of people offering fixes, reporting news from Unix conferences that they've attended, and trading software. In many ways, it sets the stage for the open source movement of the 1980s that was to come. Now, while many things went into the open source movement in the 80s, this was a key element. Many people that were active in the early Unix users groups wound up being active in the open source movement when it was first starting. I understand that the fit for this analogy isn't perfect. AT&T's Unix was available only under license, and you had to sign the license. And oftentimes, to get fixes, you had to prove that you had a license and send the license off to the other, per other people. However, this history of collaboration set the stage nicely for what was to follow. The first 10 years of Unix history was a prologue for what was to come. Unix's flexibility led to it being used in many interesting and novel ways, some at a quite early date. It's a proud legacy that lives on today in our cell phones. Please stay tuned for questions. I'll be answering them shortly, as described by the BSD CAN organizers. Thank you.